So I have a disclosure. Um, I have really no idea where autism is in the brain. This is one of the questions uh, asked. Not, don't ask me this, I have no idea. <laughs> the, the first uh, quote that I think I like this uh, is one of my hero. Uh, this is what we think we already know that often prevent us from learning. And I think in, in autism, especially in France, I will say, uh, people knew what autism was, don't have to research about it. And I think we have to be careful when we know something. And I like that quote also from uh, one of my heroes, also, uh, Louis Pasteur. Uh, there is no applied research, but application of research. So my, my group is a really a basic research lab. And we are trying to understand what is the social brain, for example, and trying to understand what's, what can be helpful for patients with autism and their family. So this is my, the, one of my um, OB in life, is to understand what is the social brain. Um, you know it better than me. I mean, we, we know very little about one brain, but when we think about two brains, that we, we know almost zero. And um, so at the, at the Institute Pasteur, so we are lucky to be really basic researchers, but also interested in public health. So we are, of course, li listening to the the, the social brain in the population, but also in patients with autism, spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, ADHD. And so to do that, we, we are uh, several people in the lab, so can you find the psychiatrist? So the psychiatrist is there, so I don't know if I can find it. It's always there. And uh, so you have a psychiatrist here, a psychiatrist, neurobiologist, bioinformatician, someone listening to mice, and. Uh, and people are the same cafe machine at the Institut Pasteur talking about the social brain. So autism is, uh, I put an S to autism because it's probably very diverse. Uh, there are two uh, diagnostic criteria now, lack of social interaction and the presence of stereotypy, restrictive pattern of interest. So the, the, the language is not anymore really in the, in the diagnostic criteria. It's more communication. Uh, because some patients, they have, uh, like in the canner type, they don't have language sometimes. And some patients with Asperger, they have normal language or even rich, richer language. Uh, there are more males than females. We, we still don't know why exactly. I think we are very bad in diagnosing aut uh, autism in girls, uh, especially in Asperger syndrome, that there is maybe a bias here. My group is working on the whole spectrum, so we're not only patients with high functioning autism or Asperger, but really patients with very severe intellectual disability and autism. There is a comorbidities like epilepsy, and the prevalence, we can talk about two hours about the prevalence, about 1%. I will show you the American slide. Uh, this is the prevalence of autism in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then I think in the New Jersey now it's one on 49. So that's the epidemic of autism. That is the, um, I think the American way of looking at the, 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 the epidemic of autism. In Europe, we're a little bit less like this. We, we, that this is a paper by Christopher Gilberg. He showed that the, the autistic trait in the population is almost stable, but in, indeed the number of patients with autism increase. And I was lucky to, to meet in, in New York. Uh, Stephen Shore is, a, is a person with Asperger's syndrome. He wrote the book Autism for Dummies. And he said, uh, autism rise exactly the same as the FedEx package, the number of FedEx package. <laughs> so he said, probably there is no correlation, and, but we, who knows? And, he, and he, he asked us, do, do you know what is between the E and the X in FedEx? Yeah, so there is an arrow. So now every time you will see a FedEx package, you will see the arrow. And he, he said, so he said two things that I think it's really, it, I mean, there is two messages. The first one, so he said, autism was there, you know, and it was, uh, but now we can see it, just like this arrow. So two messages, I think that's, it's clearly true that probably autism was there, we couldn't see it, and we, we, we didn't want to see it. And the second message is that some people with Asperger's, because Stephen Shorey has 
typical Asperger syndrome. Uh, I think it's also nice to have some people who can see the arrow uh, where I couldn't see the arrow before. So before to say we have to cure autism, we have to be very careful. Okay, so I love genetics, I love the double helix. Uh, my, my dream will go to, is to go to epigenetics and when I get older to environment. Uh, I think we are 100% genetics, 100% epigenetics and 100% environment, but I still have my own work to do on genetics. So for the phenotype, so the, 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 this equation, the phenotype equals the genotype plus the environment plus the interaction, so what is the phenotype? Uh, this is my view. I think genes don't care so much about the phenotype. I mean, the, no, they don't care about the DSM-4, sorry. They care about the phenotype. Uh, probably they don't care about the DSM-5. They never read it. And, uh, but if you think about it, everybody is trying to find one gene from one page of his book, of this book. So, and a gene for autism, a gene for uh, schizophrenia, and I think it's much more complex than this. So I invite you to, to, to read this very nice paper by Christopher Gilberg, uh, who quote this uh, acronym, uh, ESSENCE. Or Essence. Um, it's uh, for early symptomatic syndromes eliciting neurodevelopmental clinical ex examination. So what uh, Christopher said is that between zero and five, maybe we should not say autism or OCD or intellectual disability or ADHD. Maybe we should say this child has an essence uh, problem. And then to look at all these dimensions, including the one that nobody is really looking at, the sleep, the gastrointestinal problems, the, the problems that are maybe the main problem, sensory uh, perception also uh, of the, the children and the adults. So in the lab, we are looking at many, many phenotypes. Uh, of course, we are looking at the, the um, autism versus control, but we are really looking at a lot of dimensions. Uh, we are doing biochemistry, brain imaging, and iPS cells, so that some of the, we can, you can take some cells of the patients and try to derive them in neurons. So, I like that quote from uh, Temple Grandin, autism is an extremely variable disorder. Uh, and the quote from Uta, what, what is normal is usually a complicated question in terms of psychiatry. And so in, in the lab, we are trying to, to use some dimensions, like the, the, the autism uh, quotient by, by Simon. So for those, I mean, in that audience, normally I speak to geneticists, they have no idea of what's going on with autism. And, but you know, you know the autism spectrum question. For those who don't know, you have 50 questions. Uh, like some of my friends said, you have to be a little bit autistic to fill that, the, the, the 50 questions. Uh, if you have zero, between zero and five, you're not in the spectrum. If you have uh, between 45 and 50, it's okay, but probably you're a little bit in the spectrum. So that's the distribution in the general population, not diagnosed with autism and the, in the distribution in the population um, with autism that can, uh, of course, answer the, the questions. And this is the, the distribution in, in girls and in boys from the uh, general population. So I've done this, the, this test three times and I've always about 12, 13. Uh, which is, I'm less autistic than the average girl. Uh, which is maybe not so great for me because, as Asperger said, I mean, uh, it seemed that for success in science and art, a dash of autism is essential. So my group is really trying to understand what's going on in the brain of pe people with autism and, and neurotypics, but uh, not to normalize them so much. Okay, so genotype. Uh, this maybe you know less. Uh, you have about two meters of DNA in each of your cells. Uh, there is about uh, 22,000 genes. It's three billions of base pair. And uh, it's easy. It's four letters, A, T, G, C. And so you can isolate the DNA. You can amplify it. And if you see um, geneticists who are sunburned, they, they work a lot because you can, we, we look at the DNA at the UV uh, lamp. So that's my life. Uh, this is, uh, so this is part of your genome. And the difference between you and me is this. 
So we have something that we call SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, almost one SNP each 1,000 base pair, 1,000 letter. We have one SNP that is different between you and me. So sometimes it's green, so it means that if you have a C or a T or a G or A, it, it doesn't have any consequence. Sometimes it's yellow, when I put yellow, so maybe you're brun brunette or blonde, which is not a bad, I mean, which is not so pro problematic. But it's, there is an impact. And sometimes you have a red mutation, and then you're, you're, you have a disease or you're sick. The problem when you sequence the genome that you don't have the, the color, so you don't know if the mutation you have is a green one or yellow one or red one. So all the work of the lab is to try to understand what, what's going on with these variants. You have other variants, like copy number variants. So sometimes you have a, a, a loss of genetic material. For this kid, for example, he, he lost five millions of best pair with all these genes, and this kid, he, he gained one million of uh, uh, base pair. So deletions or duplications. And again, it can be green. I mean, you can, lo you can lose a lot of DNA and nothing happen. And sometimes it's yellow and sometimes it's red. So my, my, my lab is working on a different project and I will uh, mostly talk about this, the, the, the genetics and neurobiology of autism. So a little bit more than 10 years ago, I, we found these genes that are coding for the proteins here at the synapse called neuroligin. They can bind to neurexenes and they can bind to other synaptic scaffolding protein like shank. And we could find that these genes coding for this protein uh, were involved in autism. So this is the first paper. Uh, this is the, the neuroligin. I don't know if you can see it. It's a, at the synapse, it's uh, encoded on the X chromosome, and in fact, in some patients, there was, there, there was a deletion uh, uh, of this gene. So we sequenced this gene, and this is a family here with one boy with autism, his brother with Asperger syndrome, and his brother a neurotypic person. And we could find this m mutation, so this is a, normally you have T, 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 and then it's T, 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 T. So you have an extra T, just one extra T. It creates a stop codon. So normally you have the protein like this, and with this mutation, the protein is truncated. The mother carried the mutation, but she was, um, uh, she was protected because she has two X chromosomes. So one of the, the brothers, the uh, person with Asperger syndrome, for example, he wanted to be uh, a nurse, then he wanted to be a taxi driver, you know all the streets of Gothenburg. He can he can draw the streets of Gothenburg where he lives. So he, he has really typical Asperger syndrome. So at that time we had only one uh, uh, family with this uh, mutation. We looked at neuroligin three that is also on the X chromosome, and we found this mutation with arginine four five one cysteine. So it's one uh, the si uh, similar family with one child with autism and his brother with Asperger syndrome. So I will go back to this mutation later. So we were somewhere here. So it was, uh, it was not the gene for autism because it was one family in 150 families. Um, so it was not the gene for autism, but it was a, a really relevant information because if this gene is involved, then maybe the others were involved. So it was a little bit like an iron thread. If this gene was involved, you, you can find other genes. So that's what we've, uh, we have done. So, I mean, each slide is five years of work because I say that to the students because sometimes, oh, it's easy to find a gene for autism. But, uh, so the, the neural ligands, they are there and uh, they can bind directly or indirectly to this synaptic scaffolding protein shang free here. I will come back to this mutation. And uh, the neural ligands are there and they can bind to neurexins. So, at the synapse, you think maybe it's a little bit complex, but it's easy. Uh, you have the neuroligin, you have the neuroshank, and neuroaxin. So that was the first synaptic pathway um, in the brain that was associated with autism. And then, so 
researcher took it seriously. I mean, the first gene we found, they didn't take it so much seriously. The first gene we found, your ligand, um, it came out in 2003, exactly the day where Bush uh, bombed the Afghanistan. So nobody was really interested in my gene. And um, so I was afraid when I found the Cheng Free that he was bombing another country. But, and people took it seriously then, uh, and they, they, they found that Neurexin was also involved. And now, this is the, uh, the, 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 the result. So this is chromosome one, two, three, four, five, and those are all the genes that are involved, uh, at least very highly candidate or candidate for autism. But sometimes it's one gene, one child, you see. So it's very, very diverse. But the good news, as Ralph said, is that these genes, they participate to some biological function, and I've highlighted here uh, in the middle the genes that are involved in synapse. And each time there is a, a, a lane here, it means that the genes are, the proteins um, interact. So that's what uh, Guillaume has done recently, that uh, we, you can have genes that are involved in synapse, uh, regulation, transcription. So there are many, many genes, but they are they're converging to some um, biological functions. So what is the function of these genes? What are the functions of these genes? This is one, one of the works. So this is the neural ligand free, and if you have overexpressed a neural ligand free in a neuron, it will create synapses. It will trigger synaptogenesis. And you don't have to be a neurobiologist to see that the, the neural ligand free here with carrying the mutation that is involved in autism, uh, you don't have to, you, you, you can see that, I don't know if you can see, but that, I mean, there is no more synapse. I mean, this is in vitro, uh, so you, we don't know what's going on in the brain of the people with autism, but at least we know that this mutation we found are functionally uh, uh, relevant. So maybe that's the slide you have to remember. Um, there are different types of autism. Uh, you can see that you have the parents, they have no mutation, and they have, uh, aut the, the, the kids have a mutation and he has autism. So I, I say now that I have my monogenic friends and my polygenic friends. So some of my friends, they think that autism is like this, like, uh, the, the, the first case. The parents are okay, the child has a mutation. So that's the, the monogenic forms of autism. And some of my friends, I call them polygenic friends, they think that autism is like this. The parents, they are sub maybe they have some autistic traits, they carry a lot of variants and they, they go and additively the child will have autism. So there are different ways of having autism. Sometimes monogenic, sometimes polygenic. So we'll give you some example. The first one is, sorry, is Shank. So I'll go back. Yeah, and, and important information, the monogenic forms, the de novo, is highly uh, frequent in patients with autism and intellectual disability. So a message that is sometimes the geneticists, they don't tell you this, we are, quite good in, in understanding the genetics of autism in patients with in autism and intellectual disability. We're not so good in patients without intellectual disability. I showed you the all ligands are involved in Asperger, but there are not so many genes that are involved in these high-functioning forms of autism. So I'll give you several examples. Shank, I will give you some examples of contactin and uh, other um, more uh, the SNP based and frequent polymorphism with empathy and systemizing. As a deletion of the, 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 the shank, is a very severely affected in, individual. This one, he has a mutation here on the pink chromosome. This one has a pink, also the mutation. So they both have the mutation on the maternal chromosome. But when we went back to the family, to the mother, we couldn't see the mutation. So in fact, this mother, she has a mutation in the oocyte and she transmitted the mutation to both son, and that's why she's not affected. So this family was important because most of the time, especially in France, when I said I was working on autism and genetics of autism, people tell me, oh, you won't find genes for autism because there is no gene for autism. And then 
later they say, oh, you won't find genes for autism because there are too many genes for autism. But the, the, the message that you won't find. This family was showing that the, the, you can have a single mutation and you can have a severe form of autism. And not a single gene, but a single copy of one gene. So I think that was really important to, to show that. And this gene dosage is illustrated here with this little girl. She has almost no speech. She has a, a, a loss of one copy of Shang Free, and she has no speech. Her brother, he has three copies of Shang Free. Normally, you have two copies of the gene, so he has an extra copy. He started to speak before the normal age. He has a huge vocabulary, but he has problems in social interaction, stereotypy, and he has typical Asperger syndrome. So at the synapse, it looks like, and there are many cases now that are uh, with this uh, uh, Shang Free duplication. So it looks at the synapse, a very s s tight gene dosage can make you autism or Asperger of the same gene. So we ask with uh, Claire and Richard, uh, what is the prevalence and clinical impact of this mutation? And so we screen a lot of genes, we screen a lot of patients, Shank 1, Shank 2, Shank 3. And so two messages. The first one is that if you sequence the gene, you can see that patients with autism, they can have the mutation. So this is uh, here, the, oh, this is very bad. So the, the patients, they have, the, the parents, they don't have the mutation, and the child has the mutation. And we could find this shame free mutation in about 2% of the patients with autism and intellectual disability. You will say it's not so much, but it's one of the major genes for autism and intellectual disability. The, the, the second message of this study was that if you take the, the IQ and if you take the autism diagnostic interview, so the autism diagnostic interview, the more you score, the more you have problem in social interaction, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, no stereotypy. You can see that patients with Shank 1 mutation, they have a normal IQ. Patients with Shank 2, they are intermediate, and patients with Shank 3 are more severely affected. So I think it's a little bit like an eloge to psychiatry because it's almost the same genes, they are, all, they are all autistic, but you have different severity in cognitive uh, 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 performance. So that's a haute couture, you know, the, the idea is to, when you find a gene, is to go back to the patient and see what's going on. So we went back to the patients just to, I mean, I like p-value, but I'm not in love with p-value, so I wanted to see exactly what, who are the patients where we found the mutation. So we could find, for example, that most of these kids, they have the little clindodactyly, so it's a little bit pro a little problem with the, the fingers, so we can say that to the clinician. The clinician can say, okay, he has autism, clindodactyly, maybe it's chain two. Patients with chain three, the, there was a lot of deletions of, of this region, and we didn't know if they, oh, most of the kids, they have hypotonia, and now we know that chain three, per se, if you have a mutation in chain three, you can have hypotonia. So we can go back to the patients and trying to see what is the severity of autism in these patients. The second gene I will, like, I will tell you about contacting five and six are in the middle. It's not a de novo mutation. It's a mutation that is inherited sometime by, by parents with Asperger syndrome. So we were interested in contacting because we, we published uh, several papers, including this one with contactin associated protein 4 in a mouse that was uh, uh, highly uh, grooming a, a lot, and, and we found a mutation in, in, in patients with autism. The contactins are genes that are involved in neurotogenesis, so if you put contactin on a neuron, it will, it will have a, a greater neurite. And this is a paper published by one of uh, Katsutada Watanabe in Japan. And when I've seen that, I said that maybe I could t ask you, I mean, I could uh, uh, tell you where autism is in the brain. So he was looking at contacting five and six, and this is the tonotopy. So he looked at the, 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 the pattern of expression, and he found that the, the genes were highly expressed in the auditory pathway. So what he has done is to look at the tonotopy, so you have some neurons that respond to certain frequencies in your brain. So this is the, the, this is the wild type animal, and this is the knockout, the mutant 
uh, mouse. So the tonotopy is totally scrambled. So they are not deaf, but it's just like blah, 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 you know, like a frequency problem. So if, if this could happen to someone, maybe it will lead to autism or to at least to be at risk for autism. If you have a problem in the uh, uh, um, frequency of the sound. So I don't want to bother you too much with the genetics. Everything is published. You can go to the paper. But we found mutation in contact in five and six. We could find that some of the patient, some of the mutations, they really impair the, the neurotogenesis effect. And more interestingly, we found that some of the patients with the mutation, they have this hyperacusis. So they have too much sound. Uh, they were they were saying that they, they had too much sound in the area. So that's I think it's. One of the things we are following up and trying to understand what kind of risk it is to have a hyperacusis when you have uh, when you're when you're a kid and, and is it a risk for autism? This, the the last example I will give you is the uh, the, the polygenic uh, um, uh, form. So how do you address polygenic forms? I mean, the, the, I told you that we have about three million variants different between you and me, most of them are frequent in the population. And what could be the genes that, are, that could contribute to empathy and systemizing, for example? So nobody knows that before. So to give you some example, so first I would like to just to give you an, a very short genetic group, uh, lesson, but the heritability is the variance of the genetics and the variance, uh, and the variance of the phenotypes. And you can look at the genetic distance between individuals by looking at, of course, if they are brothers, sisters, twins, but you also can look at the SNP, the, this little variant in your genome. And then you can, do, you can look at the trait, you can look at the gene, and you have p-values, and you say, okay, this SNP is associated or not with, with a trait. You can do the same with another trait, and then, well, you can correlate the p-values and to see if there is a genetic correlation between one trait and another. So what you can do, for example, is to look at the genetic, the GWAS, geno genome-wide association studies, uh, p-value, and looking at the college years p-values and see if they are correlated. So this is what we have done with uh, Simon and Varun. Uh, Varun is an is amazing uh, PhD student. And, and Simon is an amazing psychologist. So it, we looked at the empathy quotient and the systemizing quotient, and also the read the mind in the eye test. And we asked 23andMe, the genetic company, to put their, the, the, the questionnaire and, uh, in, on their website. And so we get about 50,000 response uh, on, the, um, on, the, yeah, on the website for the empathy, and we get 80,000 response for the, the read the mind in the eye test. So it's totally biased. It's customers from 23andMe, so it's, it's uh, maybe not the general population, but it was interesting to see what's going on. So the score results, uh, the girls were a little bit better than boys in, in, in the empathy. You don't need 26,000 girls and boys to, to show that. Uh, boys were a little bit better in, in systemizing than girls. And when we looked at the irritability, we found that this, uh, the irritability was about 12% or about the same uh, for the EQ and the SQ. So about 12% of the score is explained by the genomes, at least by the SNPs that we genotype. And the irritability was almost the same in no different, statistically different, between girls and boys. For the read the mind in the eye test, we had about 6% of irritability. 6% of the score was uh, captured by the SNP and uh, the genetic distance. So then we can look at the genetic correlation. And so it was a little bit expected that we looked at the SQR, for example, and we found this uh, correlation, positive correlation between college years and the uh, 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 systemizing quotient. What was a little bit less expected was that the, the, the SNPs that give you a higher score in empathy were also giving you a higher risk for schizophrenia. 
Okay, so now that, now that I know this, this, I can make a beautiful story of why the, the SNPs that give you a more empathic and give you a high risk for schizophrenia, but we were not expecting this. And for the psychological traits, we found that the, the genetic correlation was with openness and also college. So, the, so this is really the beginning of this kind of studies, but you can see uh, what, what could be really powerful in the next, it's only 50,000 individuals and 80,000 individuals, so we will need more even to, to make more correlation. And if you're interested, the, the, uh, all these papers are in bioarchive, so you can go to, to see on the, web, on the website. And we found also a positive correlation between uh, higher score in the read domain in the eye test and anorexia. It's, so the genetics is captured by the SNPs, but it's very, very difficult to find the SNP. And for example, for the EQ, the empathy caution or the systemizing caution, we couldn't find any SNPs that was genome-wide significant. For the uh, read the mind in the eye test with 80,000 individuals, we could find one SNP that was uh, genome-wide significant for female, and it's, uh, it's a gene that is involved in, in neuronal uh, migration. But you can see that it's varied, the signal, it, it explained very, very few of the variants. So it's really important that you understand that you can capture part of the variance looking at the genome, but each gene will really contribute to very, very small effect. So again, so we, we are looking at genes, and now we are looking at the function of the genes. I told you that the synapse were very important, and so we are looking at the synapse. One of the explanations, or the hypothesis that we have, that normally you have the, 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 the connection is totally uh, balanced and sometimes you have less synapse, so autism type one, and maybe you have too many synapses and autism type two. We have no idea to date if it's more type one or type two. So how to study the impact of this mutation? So we looked at the mouse, and so this is, um, this is the mouse and this is Elodie. And um, so Elodie, she was listening uh, eight years ago, she was listening to baboons in Nigeria. She's an ethologist. And she came to my lab and she said uh, that she wanted to study mice. And, and I said, really, you want to be at the minus one of the Institute Pasteur? And she said, yes. And so she said, she's still there. So I, I, I said, okay, we have some mice. And, uh, and so she looked at the mice and and the first thing she found that this is a shang to wild type. So if you have never seen a, a mouse investigating a place and exploring, it's fascinating. Okay, so this is a, the wild type litter mate. And this is the shang to knockout now. So I always say if a mouse is going to a clinical uh, it will go directly to the ADHD specialist. <laughs> so that's the first thing we've seen. Uh, we've seen. So it's highly hyperactive. If you if you knock out one copy, you have you have um, you have you, you go faster. And if you knock out two copies, you you go even faster. <laughs> Sorry. So the second thing we found that they were more jumping than the others and they were grooming a little bit more than the others. The shank free knockout mouth is even grooming so much that it's very, it's very tough. Okay. And then we, we looked at different tests. I mean, really, uh, Elodie, she's an ethologist, so you can imagine she's looked, she looked at girls, boys, and um, a lot of stuff. And the, the, all the statistics are in the paper. You can look at it. So one of the things we have done is to take a male, this, so this is a male, if you, and we, we put a, a female in astros in the, in the cage. So this is a wild type behavior. So this is a little bit expected. If you have never seen a male and a female in astros in a cage, this is what happened, <laughs> at least at the Institut Pasteur. So the male is behind it, so sorry for that. 
Okay, you can, you can, okay, that was expected a little bit. And uh, on the right side, it's uh, the male with the, the knockout male. <laughs> so he has no olfactory problem. He, he, some people ask me if he's really interested by girls or not, but it's exactly the same with boys and boys and girls and girls. So you will see, it's not that he's not interested, is, uh, but is it really, when I found this gene 10 years ago, I didn't think that I could have a, a phenotype like this. So he's interested, but it's, his, his behavior is very different from, uh, from the white type later mate. He has some anxiety, social anxiety, we will test it this, so you see, it's very different. Okay, and so Elodie, she was listening to, ma to uh, uh, Baboon in Algeria, so this is a microphone here, and uh, I don't know if you know, but mice, they can sing, but they sing in the ultrasound. So, um, so that's the mouse. Did you hear? So normally it's the ultrasound, so normally you don't hear it, but we have put it in the uh, normal frequency. So Elodie, she, she recorded the mice, she cut the calls, she classified all the calls, and what she found that these mice, they, they sing less than the, the, the shang Tu mice, they sing less than the, than the wild-type litter mate, and they, they sing differently, so this is the, this paradigm that you have seen with a male and a female in estrus, and two females. By the way, if you put two males, they don't talk so much, which is, when you put two females, they talk. But, but where, where I was totally uh, sad is that they're talking about the same thing. So that was... Uh... So what we found that they, they, they have uh, also... The, so they, they talk less and they... I don't know if really they talk, but they sing less. And, uh, and they, they have also... They are using more short than expected and, uh, and, uh, and less complex calls. Uh, we also seen that they, they sing like this uh, with a lower frequency. So now what we can do is to, is to exactly to, to, to track the mice and to see when they sing. Uh, this, is the, this is one of the problems we have. We have many problems by looking at the social interaction of mice, but we don't know who is singing really. Uh, in other tests, it looks like this is a resident who is singing and the intruder is not singing. And this is... The different, we can track the animals and see exactly what they are doing. And you can see that when they are next to each other, they, 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 probably the red is singing a lot. When they are nose to nose, they don't sing. And, and when the, the, the red one is sniffing the back of the, the green one, there are a lot of vocalization, but not the, it's totally asymmetric. And look at the Shang Tu knockout. So this is the uh, completely, they, they sing, I mean, some of them sing, but some of them don't. And I think that's something that struck me in this uh, conference. There is a lot of bar plot. I mean, if I do a bar, bar plot, I'm happy with the, the average, but look at the diversity, it's really... So we have to understand why some mice are singing and some are not singing. So one of the things in the lab is trying to understand what these mice are saying. And I say to Elodie, if we want to really, if you want to understand what these mice are saying, we need a lot of vocalization. We need something like YouTube, but for mice, like mouse tube. <laughs> so normally when I say that to a, a postdoc or they don't care, and they, but she took, it care, she took it seriously. And so she sent uh, 35 emails to everybody in the world that were recording mice. And uh, she said that there will be a workshop in April in Paris. So I don't know if it's workshop or April in Paris that she had 35 positive response. And uh, there is mouse tube. If you want to go to the, uh, the, the Institute Pasteur website, where there you can upload or download the, the vocalization. Okay, so uh, some, some of the, the last slides will be on human brain diversity. Uh, one of my uh, polygenic friends, uh, Roberto, he was interested in understanding what is the irritability of the brain diversity in, in humans. So we, do, we have done exactly the same as for the, 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 the work in Simon Baron Cohen. We took 2,000 adolescents, 
with MRI data and genetics. So first results, the adolescent, they have a brain, which was uh, already... Uh, and and uh, then we looked at the genetic distance and the phenotypic distance, and we could find that about 50% of the brain volume was explained, was captured by the genetic distance. So it's quite a lot. I mean, the irritability is quite high. But when you look at each single gene, you can't find one single gene that is very genome-wide significant. So it's very diluted. So the message is very important for, you, for this audience. You can have a lot of irritability, but each gene will participate to very, very few of the variants. So what, we've, what, we also, uh, what Roberto has also done is to look at the literature and he's, he, he looked at the corpus skeletum and since 1987 there were, there were researchers who said that the corpus skeletum is smaller in patients with autism. And since then a lot of studies showed about the same. So that was, uh, that was interesting and uh, so we looked at the autism brain imaging data exchange we looked at 500 patients with autism, 500 controls after QC, it was that number. And we couldn't find anything. We couldn't, I mean, this is a p-value. So normally you don't publish with this p-value. And um, so we were uh, a little bit surprised. We looked at the, the table here. And this is the first study. So it was about 27, I mean, 13 patients, 35 patients. And when you look at the, the, you can calculate the statistical power of each study. And in fact, since 1987, the statistical power for this kind of studies were about 28% chance of looking at what they found. So the idea is where are the 70% of studies with the same design that by chance couldn't find what they found? So I asked my friends to, have you looked at the corpus skeletum? And they say, yes. And I said, did you find something? They say, no. And I said, did you publish? They said, no. So I think it's, it's really a problem in the field of genetics and problem psychology that we don't know what's going on because people are, have difficulties to share the data and to, and to do the, 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 the enough statistical power. And I think it's even worse when, when the results are going with a nice ID, you know, the left brain is not talking to the right brain, that's, the autism is like this. And I think I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that if we don't data share that the, a lot of things like this will, will collapse. Okay. So we are, we are doing new tools to share the data in the lab. And uh, for example, this is one thing that it's not published yet. So the idea is not to look at two mice, but to look at the little society of mice. And, uh, but we need some tracking system. So that's a new tracking system we have. So it's a lot of machine learning. Uh, we, can, we can have exactly the identity of each mice. We can know exactly what they are doing and uh, how they, they cooperate and how they, they, they act together. And using this system, for example, Elodie, she put two mice here. Uh, one is the wild type and one is the um, uh, knockout. You can see that the knockout is exploring everywhere, the, 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 uh, I mean, not in the center, but on the periphery. The wild type is going everywhere. And then she put an object here, a little box. And you can see that the knockout is really going into the box, into the box, and the wild type is not going. And it's, it's really, it's, it's a new tool that is it's gonna be very, very important, at least in my lab. You can do some like a Andy Warhol uh, type of thing that you can, for each mouse, you can see now what, how they behave and you can spot exactly what the, the, the mice are doing. And I showed that uh, last week and uh, I met a psychologist, sometime it's happened, and, she, and a French psychologist and she said, oh, these lines, they remind me some of uh, Fernand de Ligny, so he was a, uh, it was very nice. I thought it was a, a, he was a teacher who was very interested in patients with autism. And he, was, he bring the, the patients with autism at the, on the countryside. And he was looking at the, what he called the wonder line. He was looking at the trajectories of the patients. And I thought, I thought it was a, so you think you have a machine learning things and you, you're new, but it was already there. 
Okay, so with, uh, we are going back to the patient. I think it's really important. I mean, I like my genes, but we have to go back to the patient and to see what's going on. Uh, uh, Guillaume uh, Dumas in my lab is now doing the, the hyperscan in patients with autism to try to understand what, what is really a social brain interacting. Uh, Roberto has done, he, he was one of the fin finalists of the Open Science Prize. He has done what? Brain Box. You can go to the, our website. And uh, this is a, a tool where you put the MRI brain of a lot of people and you can do the QC and share the data and to have, uh, to have more, more uh, robust finding. At the genetics level, uh, people are looking at single gene. So we, are, we have made a, we made a tool where you can see all the mutation that someone has in their genome and, and map them on a protein-protein interaction network. So if for each gene, you can have some information. So the perspectives. Okay, so that's the main slide. I mean, there are genes for autism, but sometimes it's very monogenic, sometimes it's very polygenic, and sometimes it's between. So please don't, don't say that there is one gene or it's polygenic. It will be very different from one child to another. This is my RNB model, the rare and background model. Some, for some patients, with a genome that is red like this. It's very highly sensitive, and a very small number of variants, rare variants, will make the person autistic. And for some, the, the, the genome is very robust and very resistant, and, and you need a very strong mutation like Chang free to have autism. So one of my heroes, Claude Bernard, used to say that the use of the average in physiology and medicine usually give a false precision resource in destroying the biological character of phenomena. And I think that's one of the things I've learned today, I mean, during the three days. I think we are doing a lot of bar plot and with a little star, I think we have to, uh, to think of a more dimensional aspect. This is also my, one of my hero. Uh, I, I always love that quote, I accept chaos, I'm not sure whether it accepts me, and I think we have to accept a little bit uh, chaos and complexity. Okay, so that's my new project, the risk and resilience. Um, Sometimes I, I, I see the genome of someone and I say, wow, this person has intellectual disability or, or autism, and in fact, no, it is a father or she's a mother or an, an affected sheep, and it's really... Uh, very strange. And so I want to understand what's going on and, uh, and um, how, people, how some people can cope with very strong mutation. Uh, because I like that quote also. The best doctor is nature. It cures three quarters of the disease and never speak bad of his colleagues. <laughs> and I think if we understand what nature can do, we can do that. Okay, so we have to improve data sharing. This is really important. I mean, uh, alone in our lab, we will make I think it's going to be a mess. We need to really work together. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, lucky to work with, uh, Chris, with Richard, uh, Marion, uh, th these guys, I mean, Eva and Declan Murphy. I mean, I didn't know Declan five years ago. I mean, it's, a, it's quite amazing. So we, we can really make a, a, a data sharing um, project that can really help a, a lot of people that have no money to collect the data and to use the data for their own ideas. Okay, so the idea is to have more data on, on patients, genetics, but also a lot of dimensions to stratify. So why find genes for autism? I would say my answer is to find the best environment. So in, in autism, it's probably not like this. It's probably a little bit more like this. With some patients with uh, the Nurex in your like in Shang pathway, some will be like the mTOR pathway, some will be like other pathways that are still uh, have to be discovered. Um, as Lorna Wing said, if you have seen one child with autism, you have seen one child with autism. <laughs> and I think as a geneticist, exactly what I think. Okay, so one of my best environments, les amis, this, I mean, all this work could have done, be done by, by a lot of people, and uh, Guillaume is there, but really a lot of people are working. L'argent, the money, which is really important, and uh, uh, thanks all the pe people who uh, give the money. And uh, Les Familles, uh, I love that title, uh, No Mind Left Behind. 
Uh, I think it's it's uh, the social brain meeting organized by Christopher Gilberg. I've, I love that 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 title. Uh, I always say to my uh, geneticist friend or neurobiologist that it's great to sequence DNA and to look at synapse, but it's also really great to uh, to read what the people and to talk with people with autism because it's not so simple. And um, I like that book also. This is a father who discovered that her daughter has autism. And on the t-shirt, it is written, uh, I am unique just like everyone else. So this is my last phrase. Merci.